Wow. Blue pine. I wonder what I could use that for. So what can I make out of it? You know what, I think I can make a table. Beetle kill pine, blue pine, still like the same thing. There's this disaster going on up in Colorado right now where all these mountain beetles are killing all the pine trees. As a result, Colorado's wiped out a bunch of trees and pretty much given it out to the lumber companies, which is why it's available pretty cheap. Found that out on Wikipedia. Um, so I'm gonna take you through multi-step process. I'm going to glue up these boards. I'm going to coat them with some epoxy. I'm going to use some black gas pipe as the legs and I'm going to show you all how I did it. I'm going to turn blue pine from this into this. Let's go. Before I even get started with plank assembly, I need a workspace at least as large as the piece I'm ultimately going to be working on. In this case, I'll be building three tables with the longest just over six feet, so that means a work surface just over six feet. I currently don't have any work surface that long, so I'm going to build a temporary one. A simple 2x4 frame covered in OSB will work well. In addition, I'm going to provide the needed space. A flat surface will help really help keep the planks straight while I'm going and gluing them up. And then to finish up, I'm just going to do a quick once over with the belt sander. My favorite method of joining individual planks is by using a combination of wood biscuits and pocket hole screws. The biscuits really help keep the planks level with each other while the pocket screws provide some immediate holding power, negating the need to clamp and wait. In this case, I'm using the Craig Pocket Jig and a Porter Cable Biscuit Joiner. Many people could do without the joiner, but I think a pocket hole jig is essential for any shop. Because I'm using 1x4 stock, which really means a 3 quarter inch piece of plywood, sorry, 3 quarter inch piece of work surface, I'm going to back it with some 3 quarter inch sanded plywood. This will really help both structurally and aesthetically. 1.5 inches is a much more appropriate tabletop thickness anyway, and 3 quarters of an inch itself wouldn't be stiff enough, especially over a span of 6 feet. Finally, backing it with a really flat piece of plywood helps straighten out any warping that might have occurred when gluing. To get this done fast and strong, I'm going to go ahead and glue and screw the plywood back to the beetle kill pine surface. I'm pre-drilling and countersinking three rolls of holes for the fasteners spaced every six inches. I'll then caulk on my favorite general purpose construction adhesive, PL375, and mate the two pieces. After the plywood and beetle pine have been joined, one thing will become really obvious. Lumber purchased from a home store has a lot of length variation. But not to worry, now that the flush plywood and plank ends, to do so I'm going to clamp a straight edge on my workpiece and flush the ends in one cut with my circular saw. To get things even straighter, I'm going to run my flush trim bit around the entire perimeter, flip the piece over and do the same thing again. The result is what we'll have a tabletop with the front and back that is perfectly signed and aligned. Even though we use biscuits to keep all the planks level, we're still going to have some uneven ridges. This is where the belt sander comes into play. I know a lot of people who don't like it because it has the ability to ruin work very quickly, but when used properly, it's one of the best tools in the shop. I always keep mine attached to a tool speed control and try and work in strokes parallel to the grain of the wood. Most importantly, keep your belt flat on the workplace.
For the finished edges, I ripped some 1x4 stock in half lengthwise on my table saw. I then mitered, measured, and cut to length along the unfinished edge. In order to secure the glue while the glue dried, I tacked the pieces under my place using my 18 gauge brad nailer. If this were a real presentation piece, it probably would have been worth it to use biscuits or dowels again, and then clamping to avoid nail holes, but I wanted to get this project done and I was running seriously low on time. Of course, now we're left with approximately one eighth of an inch that needs to come off. To take care of this, I'm once again going to use my router flush trim bit. I really can't emphasize enough the importance of a router to anyone looking to get into any type of woodwork. After routing, it's time to once again break out the belt sander and really get this thing flat. Following that, I'm going to use my random orbit sander and 150 grit discs. It's very important that the workpiece be smooth before moving on to the next step, filling in any holes, spaces, knots, etc. I like to use a catalyzed polyester resin based wood filler. That's fancy talk for Bondo or Minwax's high performance line. It's much much tougher than ordinary one part filler and most importantly can be sanded within a couple of minutes. So this is a little technique I came up with to keep my repairs straight. I mask off the area with a little blue painters tape. Um, in addition to providing a guide for the putty knife it also helps you uh, keep track of where you need to fill. Uh, wait a couple of minutes for it to tack up and then peel off the tape and then scrape off uh, with a razor blade. This is also kind of why I mentioned that you want to make sure it's sanded real smooth beforehand because if it's not real smooth, what's going to happen is your blade or your razor is going to end up digging into the wood and causing more hassle than it's worth. After you kind of scrape off this little uh, ribbon of Bondo or Minwax High Performance, a real quick sand with 180 grit will get it pretty flawless and it'll only take you just a couple of minutes. So what I do in order to get the rounded corners is I have a corner pattern that I trace using a pattern bit on my router. I then flip the workpiece over, change bits to a trim bit and duplicate it on the other side. To get a nice edge profile, I'm going to go ahead and use a 3 quarter inch roundover bit on the back side. I'm going to turn the workpiece over and use a 3 8 inch roundover bit on the top side. So it's going to be a little more rounded on the bottom side, which I think is kind of a more natural look to a table.
All right, all right, all right. It's time to mix up some epoxy. I'm using a marine grade epoxy here purchased on Amazon. Uh, it's gonna end up being a two coat application, a base coat to kind of seal the wood. Then I'm gonna sand it up and put a gloss coat on. I always buy more than I need. Uh, in this case, I bought a full gallon, not really anticipating using most of it. And I used about half of it. So mix it up, stir it for a few minutes and kind of uh, go to town here. So like I just mentioned, I'm gonna do two applications of epoxy. The very first one is just gonna get the epoxy into the wood, kind of seal it up. Um, so it's gonna be a lighter application. Uh, I'm gonna end up using a uh, like a Bondo spreader or you could use a drywall knife or any, any type of flat spreader really because you're gonna end up basically troweling most of it off. So right here, I'm actually using a decent amount of pressure to try and get almost all the epoxy off that I can. Um, as you can see, it's already kind of soaked into the wood. You can kind of see the change in color. And you'll actually be quite surprised at, at just how much epoxy this wood soaks up. All right, so about 24 hours have gone by now, and I'm gonna do a 320 grit wet sand. And, you know, honestly, at this point, if you wanted to, you could almost be done with it. This will provide kind of a satin look. Some of the wood will sort of still be there. Uh, obviously not gonna be as durable as if you do a, a full thick second coat, but some people might like this look, and, it, and it's gonna be a medium durability finish, and it's probably good enough for a table, maybe not durable enough for a desk or something like that. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and put the second final coat on. And this time I'm not gonna use a flat trowel, I'm gonna use a notched trowel because that's gonna kind of guarantee that the required thickness um, of epoxy stays on the surface because when you're using a, a flat trowel, obviously it's gonna pull off a lot. By using a notched trowel, it's gonna kind of maintain a uniform thickness over the entire surface. And um, I think it'll give it a real nice result here. I used 1 16th of an inch. 
and I felt that worked out um, appropriately. They have these little like dollar spreaders at Lowe's and Home Depot, and they're kind of one-time use things unless you feel like cleaning off a bunch of epoxy afterwards, which I like most certainly do not. So you're going to be left with a bunch of bubbles after you travel on all the epoxy and to take care of that you just want to hit it with a uh, blowtorch really quick like the heat from the gun pretty much pops the pops them like the second that it actually hits them you don't want to linger because you'll burn the epoxy really quickly but uh, just kind of run over it pretty quickly here and, and it'll be left with a pretty flawless finish. I don't really know how much explanation this needs, but basically I'm just gonna countersink the uh, flanges holes a little bit, just so the flathead screw sits uh, really flush with them. I mean, if you don't care, you could probably skip this step too. So because I had some extra epoxy mixed up from another project I was working on, I decided to go ahead and coat all the flanges that are gonna be flush against the floor, just because, well, it's uncoated metal, so it could potentially rust and stain any flooring it's touching. So um, I, I thought it was a good idea, just because I don't wanna mess up any flooring. Right here, I've already just traced out the uh, hole pattern for the flanges, and I'm gonna go ahead and install some thread inserts. I use thread inserts on almost all my projects that involve screws, just because it provides a more holding power than a screw alone, and it makes removing and assembly and disassembly a ton easier, because, yeah, you're not fatiguing the hole. So I just kinda start with a little pilot hole here, and then I use a Forzner bit and countersink it just a little bit so the, the flange of the uh, thread insert sits flush with the surface of the workpiece. And then after that, using a little bit of tape on my drill bit, I um, you know drill, make the pilot hole for the thread insert and I use the piece of tape just to mark my depth so I don't actually punch all the way through. When installing thread inserts, I always put a little bit of wood glue on it because it adds a lot of strength to the hole. It's kind of anecdotal, but all I know is that after I glue these things in, I pretty much can't get them back out even if I try. So it's a habit I've always been into. You probably don't need to do it, but I think it works well.
that's it that's my table and if i were to give someone advice i would say this don't do it well maybe maybe not like don't do it but don't use pipes for legs pipes are made for carrying water or possibly carrying gas or carrying something it's not meant to be a table leg um I did it because I thought it'd be quick, I thought it'd be cheap, and I was running low on time. But as it turns out, between getting the different fittings and working out the different sizes and having Lowe's or Home Depot cut the pipe, I ended up spending a lot more than what if I would've just went to the metal store and cut it and welded it or gone on Amazon and searched for table legs and bought them there. So by all means, the Blue Pine is really cool stuff and it makes a great tabletop. Epoxy, it's a little tricky to work with, but with a little practice, you can get some fantastic results at home. Um, but yeah, do yourself a favor and don't, don't use pipes for legs. They're not meant for that. They're meant for being buried in the ground or mounted in a wall. Um, go on Amazon, search for table legs. Go to Home Depot and buy table legs. Go on Craigslist and rip some table legs off some used furniture and repaint them, but anything besides pipes. Um, that's going to do it. As always, appreciate you watching. If you liked what you saw today, please give me a thumbs up. If you didn't like what you saw, please give me a thumbs down. And um, we're going to go ahead and catch you on the next video.